Hello everybody, welcome back to Point Zero Games. My name is Josh. Uh, if you were watching this video, you probably came from our last video on the pre-release primer for Dragons of Tarkir. If not, welcome, and we are going to teach you now how to build a sealed deck specifically for the Dragons of Tarkir pre-release events. Now, with the Dragons of Tarkir pre-release happening this weekend, we definitely needed to make sure that we had a tutorial video out there for you. This is probably one of the most commonly asked questions at any pre-release event among the people who attend. And throughout this video, we're going to offer the tips that you need in order to do pretty well, pretty well at your local events. We're not going to guarantee great, but pretty well. Now to begin, let's talk about the Dragons of Tarkir release specifically. Now, when your event begins, you'll receive a box representing one of five Dragon Lords featured in the Dragons of Tarkir set. These are going to be Atarka, Ojutai, Dromoka, Silimgar, and Kalagon. Now, that box is going to contain four booster packs of Dragons of Tarkir, one booster pack of Fate Reforged, and a sixth booster that's commonly called a Seated Booster. Because of the Seated Booster, typically what these boxes are referred to is Friendly Sealed, so do remember that. Now, the Seated Booster is going to feature cards that are going to be within a color scheme of whatever Dragon Lord box you've received. For instance, Dromoka is a green-white dragon, therefore your Seated Booster will contain green and white cards. You'll also get the promo card for the event inside of this, and that could be one of multiple different cards. Now, at most events, you'll be allowed to trade the boxes with someone else to try and get a specific color scheme that you're wanting. However, that's not necessarily always true. There are some venues that don't do this, and if they don't, don't freak out too bad. You'll be all right. Don't worry. You get four packs of Dragons, a Tarkir, and a Seated Booster. You're, you're getting a lot of product for your money, all right? Now, once you have your box, your venue is typically going to give you an allotted amount of time in order to build a deck with the cards that you've unpacked from your pre-release box. Usually, that's going to be somewhere around 20 minutes. Some places will do 15, some places will do 25. So it's a bit lenient, but 20 is a general average time that you'll end up getting. Now, these are the only cards that you're going to be allowed to use in your sealed deck, save for the basic lands, which typically your venue will provide on a separate table somewhere else. Now, you have your cards unpacked, and the big question arises. How many cards should my deck be? How many lands should I run? What color? How many colors should I use in my deck? What colors should I use in my deck? What should my deck be built with? Let's tackle that one by one, going from the easiest to the hardest. I don't know why I put the hardest at the bottom. Because you hit rock bottom hard. Patrick smile. He's holding my script. <laughs> Anyways, first, your deck's going to be a minimum of 40 cards. Now, in all honesty, this is the prime number that you want your cards to be. You don't really want to go over 40, and you definitely can't go under 40, because if you do, you'll be disqualified. Now, um, as for adding anything beyond that, it's just throwing away your balance. You need to try and have consistency overall, and since you're most likely only going to be getting one or two copies of any given card, 40 card helps with the overall consistency of your draws. Second, you're usually going to want to run somewhere between 17 to 18 lands if you're looking at a really high mana curve, and in limited setting you typically are. Now that's going to be pretty typical for most decks. However, if you somehow have a strong deck with a lower mana curve, then you could get away with running something like 16 lands. But in my own personal experience, even in that case, it still tends to lead to slightly less a slightly less mana efficient sealed deck than what you'd like to have happen. So I would definitely recommend 17 to 18 lands overall. Now third, let's talk about the colors of your deck. Now, since the Tar Dragons of Tarkir is mostly a dual colored set, and Fates Reforged had only a couple of tri-colored cards, if I remember correctly, it was mostly solo and dual colored, that means that your safest and best bet is going to be, I almost said bestest, best bet is going to be to stay within two colors. You can possibly go three, but I mean, let's be real. Two colors is going to be the best for your overall mana efficiency. Now, you don't have to stay within the colors of your box. Don't let that be the thing that determines your deck. If you get a Dromoka box, which represents green and white, and you pull crap in green and white, don't play green and white. If you pull crap in everything else, maybe play green and white. But overall, you want to play with whatever you pull strongest in, all right? If you get a Dromoka box that's green and white, and instead you pull green and red, play green and red. You want to 
have the best potential way of winning the game. Now, lastly, let's talk about what your deck should be comprised of. Now, this is gonna be the longest part because we're gonna discuss specific cards that are within Dragons of Tarkir, uh, as well as the paradigms that they can fit into. So, let's list off all of these. Typically, you wanna have something close to about 14 to 16 creatures, and then other spells to support your deck to fill in the rest, then the 17 or 18 lands that you're gonna want in order to give yourself some mana to cast those spells with. Now, board presence, when it comes to sealed, is always a huge deal. And this is the one time where creatures you would typically look at as being, ah, that's a terrible creature, why would I ever play it, are actually gonna be really good. Did you happen to see the uncommon cycle of six drop three three dragons? They're not gonna be played in standard, modern, constructed, anything. But guess what? It's a bomb and limited. Now, what's a bomb? What is that? You'll hear all kinds of crazy words getting thrown out like that every once in a while. You'll probably heard somebody say, that's a bomb and limited. The decision-making process for what you're going to use on your cards is go goes by a general rule that we call BREAD. Now that's going to be an acronym that stands for BOMBS, Removal, Evasion, Aggro, and then the fifth letter, D, typically stands for duds amongst people, but personally, I consider it for defense, and I'll explain that reason in a little bit. However, let's go down the list here of each of those letters and explain exactly what each of them represent. First, let's start with bombs. Bombs are a tricky thing to actually discuss because essentially it's a big card that can swing the game in your favor one way or the other, hopefully for the way that's going to get you the win. Now this can be anything from big stompy creatures like the Dragon Lords and Dragons of Tarkir. It could be uh, a huge board wiper that ends up clearing the field and letting you get a hard reset. It could even be a huge pump spell like Become Immense was in the Cons of Tarkir set. There are multiple different ways to, to have a bomb, big creatures with huge mana costs. Removal is also something that's pretty obvious as an acronym letter. Uh, it's anything that would get rid of cards from the battlefield, a player's hand, a graveyard, etc. So you gotta think of cards inside of Dragon's Tark here like Rending Volley, Defeat, Ultimate Price, or Surge of Righteousness. These are all really strong removal cards and removal is massively important and it's not just limited to instants or sorceries or enchantments. Sometimes you can look at a creature that can serve as some form of removal. Take, for instance, Conifer Strider. This is going to be a four drop green hexproof creature in Dragons of Tarkir that has a power of five, but only a toughness of one. It could be an aggressive card, but it can also kill out a lot of creatures that want to swing in at you. So always make sure you look at removal from all angles, not just instants, sorceries, and enchantments. Next, we're going to look at evasion. Now, evasion is going to be any form of ability or trigger or keyword that allows your creatures to get through an opponent's front line and deal damage to your opponent. Uh, your main source of evasion is going to be flying, but there are other keywords and triggers that you can look for, such as can't be blocked or can't be blocked except by X number of creatures. Now, some prime examples of evasion that are going to be within this set would be something like magmatic chasm or the formidable trigger on a Tarka Pummeler. Uh, even better, anything with flying. There's dragons. There's a lot of them. There's actually like three cycles of dragons, so you could use pretty much any of them. I think there might actually be four. So yeah, plenty of evasion in this set, and most of the color schemes should have no problem being able to land a dragon for evasive purposes. Next, let's talk about aggro. Now, aggro is all about your overall level of aggression. Now, in sealed competition, this is going to be uh, anything that can pummel someone as hard and as much as possible. It's going to cover any creatures with haste. It's going to cover pump spells that are going to make your dudes hit for a ton of damage. It could be anything that gives you trample, any creatures with trample. It could be any form of burn spell, anything that is just going to be harsh and aggressive to your opponent's life total. Now, any of the creatures that you'll find in this are typically going to have a general overall range of mana costs, but in a lot of cases, this does focus on lower mana creatures and lower mana spells to ramp up into your bigger mana curve. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that you could look at a card like, say, Surak the Hunt Caller and not categorize him as aggro. I mean, he's a 
four drop five four with a formidable trigger so i mean he covers half of the formidable cost already pretty fantastic also watch out for that guy mono green constructed standard he's going to be insane next let's talk about the d i don't mean that d As I said before, there's many that'll call D duds inside of this. And frankly, I think that's almost demeaning. I mean, there's very few times that I've played a sealed round or a draft round, and I've been able to look at a card and say, what a complete and utter dud. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are times in draft that I've been able to say, wow, that's terrible. But in sealed, every card that you pull, in most cases, are gonna potentially be worth something to your deck. I mean, unless your name is Meandering Tower Shell, or your Time Warp version, Wandering Tomb Shell. Those were pretty bad cards. Nobody plays them. Nope. Ever. Nope. Anyways, instead, I look at D and I call it defense. Here's why. Because in a game, you can have all kinds of aggression, but sometimes you just need a wall to stop people from hitting your face. And in turn, this is going to include anything that ranges from counter spells to death touch, fogs, and creatures with fat asses. I mean, if it's got six on the ass, it could be good, you know? So you're going to look at cards like uh, Yukod uh, Cobra. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yukod Cobra. Um, he's a 2-5 with death touch for four. He's pretty good. Uh, you've got Contradict. Um, you've got the Car C Deceiver and... Crap, now that I think about it, Wandering Tomb Shell is a 1-6. He's actually a really defensive card. He might actually be good in a sealed match. That's that's troubling. A little bit. Especially since there's like a 1 or a 2 drop that gives Death Touch. Okay, so maybe Wandering Tomb Shell. Not the worst card that you could ever draw. Now, you'll also have things like Hexproof or Protection from Creatures or Colors of any type that can end up being really strong. So things like Glint and Dragon Hunter. Especially Dragon Hunter, he's a one-drop white creature with protection from dragons and reach. That's stupid! In a sealed environment, if you pull Dragon Hunter, he should immediately be in your deck. Like, I don't even care if you're playing white, put a couple of planes in and play that guy. He's, he's fantastic. You kind of need to do that. Um, anyways, this is just a way of saying this is going to keep you from losing things. This is going to give you a way to keep from taking lethal damage. So now that we've got... Uh, each of those out of the way. Let's take a look at uh, the cards and let's find some synergies between them because that's the way that you want to build your sealed deck. Does this work with that? How does this work here? Um, so for instance, I mean, if you're looking at your creatures and they've got a lot of strong power and you've got a lot of formidable triggers, those can work together in tandem for each other to offer you abilities for potential aggression and evasive capabilities. Meanwhile, if you're looking at something like a white deck that has a lot of bolster capabilities and you've got some decent creatures over here with evasion, that could potentially be a way to go also. So you def excuse me, you definitely do want to make sure that your synergies are in line. Now, if you have a lot of low end creatures and a lot of pump spells, you could potentially end up making a really fast aggro deck that makes dudes really big really fast and maybe end your rounds pretty quick. So in the end, the deck is going to be built based on whatever strengths you find within the two colors that you end up deciding to play. Just, rem just remember to play within colors that you have strong pulls in and not necessarily just because you've got this super cool promo card that you feel needs to be the crux of your deck. That's not how sealed works, guys. So make sure that you stray away from that. Um, next, uh, we're gonna talk about sideboard. As far as, uh, as, far as the sideboard uh, is concerned, that really ends up depending on your venue in a lot of ways. Now, there are some places that have rules for a limited sideboard, while there's others that will say any card that you've packed is a sideboard card. You can put any of those into the sideboard if you want. There's even places that will actually let you switch cards out in the middle of the tournament uh, you know, so that way you can try and make your deck a little bit stronger. Talk to your venue, find out what the rules are for those types of things. Now, I typically like to keep about five to seven cards off to the side as a sideboard just to make sure that I can fill spots that I need taken care of against certain color combos. And in particular, it means that I have more synergy towards my deck because I've particularly picked those cards for what my deck is doing. Now, it's also good practice to get into to have this limited sideboard, and it's going to help you understand more cards as well as increase your chances of winning. 
Um, and that's it. That's how you build a sealed deck, guys. Those are all the tools that are necessary for you to build it. You guys should be doing great on the pre-release event with this advice. The only other things that I could honestly recommend to you would be to bring some sleeves. About 50 is usually good enough so that we can sleeve your cards up, make sure they don't get all dirty and nasty. You don't know where the other guy's hands have been. You know, just, you know, safe, safe stuff. You might pull a Narset that you don't want getting oilied up, all right? Also, another thing that you should do is go check out any given website that has all of the cards released. All the cards have been spoiled already. Go to any of those sites and familiarize yourself with every single card. The reason being is once you familiarize yourself with what the cards particularly do, it means that when you're sitting there unpacking during that 20 minute allotted time, you don't have to sit there and go, read, 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 what does this card do? Read, 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 I don't want that. Read, read, read. Do you see how long that's taking? I mean, this is the average amount of time that it takes to read a card and then put it down, read a card, put it down. Familiarize yourself with this stuff, familiarize yourself with the names because you're going to be playing them in standard and modern anyway, so you might as well go ahead and do that so that way you can make sure that you can just burn through those cards as fast as possible. So bring some sleeves, familiarize yourself with everything, and beyond that, um, just make sure that you, you look at your land base, count your mana base. Uh, that's a huge thing. If you've got a lot of double costs, make sure that you've got the right amount of mana to ensure that you can uh, cast anything that you need to. That's all the time that we've got. Hopefully this video was helpful for you. Share it with your friends who are going to be joining the pre-release events. I hope everybody ends up doing incredibly well. Uh, leave us a comment in the bottom after the pre-release. Let us know what you guys pulled. Um, you know, that's it. You know, like, share, comment, subscribe. I got nothing else. I'm ready. I'm psyched. I'm probably not playing. I'll probably be in Temple. We'll see what happens. He's not ready. He's going blues. It's going to be hilarious. That might end up happening. On behalf of myself and Mr. Patrick, this is Point Zero Games. You guys have a fantastic day.